It's called opposition research or even research into your opponent. I feel like the whole, like, the past five years have blurred into, like, one year. <laughs> Venezuelan police have detained six people they suspect of using drones carrying explosives to try to assassinate President Nicolas Maduro. Y no tengo duda que todo apunta a la derecha, a la ultraderecha venezolana en alianza contra la ultraderecha colombiana y que el nombre de Juan Manuel Santos está detrás de este atentado. A magnitude 7.0 earthquake hit the Indonesian island of Lombok on Sunday, killing at least 98 people. Indonesia's disaster agency says most people were killed by debris from collapsing buildings. It's the second deadly earthquake on the island in a week. PepsiCo's first female CEO, Indra Nui, is stepping down after 12 years. Nui was one of just three minority women to lead a Fortune 500 company. There are now more men named Timothy on the list than there are non-white women. YouTube deleted the channel of noted conspiracy theorist Alex Jones, following similar actions from Facebook, Apple, and Spotify. YouTube says Jones violated its community guidelines, including its policies against hate speech. I told you this was coming. But they use military tactics. They would always say, no one's censoring you. Nobody took you off YouTube or Facebook. What are you talking about? Nobody. Until they finally dropped the hammer. Police in Berkeley, California, arrested 20 people on Sunday as they tried to keep leftist groups and alt-right marchers away from each other at a public park. This kind of brawl is becoming a regular weekend event in liberal strongholds along the West Coast. On Saturday in Portland, the conservative group Patriot Prayer held its third rally in just two months. Everybody came here for a higher cause. It's not ourselves, God. So we're asking you to guide us to take this march, take it to the right spot, and to make sure we show this country what it is to be a real American. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. USA! USA! Joey Gibson is the founder of Patriot Prayer, a right-wing group that says it stands for free speech and disavows racism, but has a history of holding rallies that attract white supremacists. Gibson is also running for Senate as a Republican in Washington state. But instead of talking to voters in his own state, he keeps coming back to Portland, Oregon, a city that his group says needs to be cleansed. Gibson's most recent rally here was in June. Police declared it a riot, and five people were sent to the hospital. When Gibson announced he'd be coming back this month along with the Proud Boys, he encouraged his followers to bring guns. Local Antifa said they would counter protest. So did a coalition of activists called Pop Mob, short for popular mobilization. We want a world free from white supremacy, free from racism and xenophobia. And we think that believing in these things is what makes you an anti-fascist. So what are you telling people to do when, for example, a group like Proud Boys, a group like Patriot Prayer comes in for them? To unite, to become a power that uh, is impossible to ignore mm -hmm. and to have a huge show of strength that says we're not going to tolerate it anymore. The pop mob said there were about a thousand counter protesters in all. Patriot Prayer only had about 200 people on their side. Regular, get the fuck out of Portland! Go back across the border, Taco! Yeah! But Joey Gibson isn't playing a numbers game. He wants to create scenes that will make leftists look violent and make him look like the victim. He did it at Berkeley last year, and he did it again this Saturday in Portland. He's got a formula. Walk into counter-protesters, provoke a violent reaction, then retreat back behind the police line. Later, he posts a video of the whole thing on Facebook. to where you know people are going to attack you. Well, we got to build the bridge. So they're dividing us on purpose. If they want to attack me, they can, but I'm not going to fight back. So, and we got it on camera. They didn't really attack me that bad anyway, so. Right, so is that, are you just going over to provoke people? No. No.
so far, Gibson's strategy seems to be working. He's announced that he'll be holding a rally against left-wing violence next week, this time in Seattle. Portland police arrested four leftists on Saturday. They also announced they'd be investigating reports that their stun grenades injured counter-protesters. Adam Brockman is a counselor on Pop Mob's mental health team. Have you ever thought that maybe if we just stay home, that would be better? There's yeah. nobody to fight. There's no bad PR. Somebody comes, they yell a little bit, they wave some flags, we all go home, we're happy. You ever thought about that? Yeah, I think that if we could just like turn our backs on them and ignore them, then then I think that fascism would have been eradicated a long time ago, but that's not how it works. Um, I think that they, you know, even though it is, it's, it's risky, it is politically risky to come out here and confront them, I think it's absolutely necessary. On Sunday, President Trump tweeted that the June 9th, 2016 meeting at Trump Tower run by his son was an attempt to get political dirt on Hillary Clinton from Russian operatives during the campaign. This was a seismic event in Washington, even though the president said basically the same thing at a press conference with the president of France last year. Most people would have taken that meeting. It's called opposition research. This is the basic White House line on that Don Jr. meeting. They say it was standard practice, political opposition research. That line's been around for a while. It's also been workshopped quite a bit over time. Starting out, the Trump team said no one senior on the campaign had met with a Russian operative ever. Then on July 8th, 2017, the New York Times broke the Trump Tower story. Then Trump Jr. admitted the meeting had in fact taken place, but that it was about adoption policy. He later said his father knew nothing about it. The Trump White House eventually admitted the president had dictated his son's statement, saying the meeting was actually about adoption. Which is why the new Trump tweet, saying it was about Clinton dirt, is a big deal. Trump also said in the tweet the meeting was totally legal. He may not be right there. Section 110.20 of the Code of Federal Regulations says it's against the law for a foreigner to quote, directly or indirectly make a contribution or a donation of money or other thing of value in connection with any state, federal, or local election. Opposition research is expensive when it's done properly, and so it could be seen as something of value. The Trump campaign says it didn't use anything from the meeting, but seeking it out might be enough. So on the question of whether or not the meeting was legal, it's murky. What about the it's totally normal for a campaign to work with a foreign power part of the Trump defense? Well, that's murky too. In October 1968, the Nixon campaign straight up colluded with the government of South Vietnam to prevent the Johnson administration from reaching a peace settlement and end the Vietnam War. Johnson wasn't running for re-election, but the idea was if Democrats couldn't end the war, people would vote for the Republican Richard Nixon, who promised that he would. Nixon denied the hell out of this, but after he died, we learned it did happen thanks to handwritten notes left behind by an aide. There are famous rumors of other presidential campaigns doing similar things. One of Jimmy Carter's aides accused Ronald Reagan's team of working with Iran in 1980 to delay the release of American hostages. We never learned the history or the real story about this stuff. And the presidents involved have skated by unscathed. But there's a key difference. Those old allegations came up after the fact. The Trump inquest is playing out more or less in real time. Reports of alleged presidential misdeeds are coming out almost every day. The president is tweeting his lines of defense as they pop into his head, and the special counsel is watching all of it very closely. New Mexico's Deb Holland could be the first Native American woman in Congress. Christy Nome is a step closer to being the first woman to serve as South Dakota's governor. And at 28, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez of New York might be the youngest woman ever elected to Congress. They're all part of what has been called the Year of the Woman 2.0, a political wave that has more than 700 women running for federal and statewide positions, far exceeding the original Year of the Woman in 1992. But more men are running too. 
And that means women still make up less than a quarter of congressional candidates. For that to change, it isn't enough for more women to run. They also need to win. And on that front, things are looking pretty good, at least if the primaries are any indication. As of today, almost two-thirds of women running for higher office this year have faced their first contests. Most of these women are Democrats. They make up about 70 percent of female candidates. Republican women account for just 30 percent. In primary races so far, Democratic women have won more than half of their contests. Republican women have done well, too. They've been successful in just under half of theirs. On both sides of the aisle, women are seeing the most success in House races. Success in races for governor and Senate seats has been harder, with women overall winning about a quarter of those primaries. Tomorrow, 62 more women will run in primaries in Kansas, Michigan, Missouri, and Washington. They hope to join the 244 women who have won races for federal and statewide positions so far. Of course, that's just the primaries. The real test for female candidates is what happens on November 6th. President Trump will reimpose sanctions on Iran at midnight tonight, completing his torching of the nuclear deal. Practically speaking, it means that the U.S. won't just stop doing business with Iran, but also with any company that doesn't follow its lead. Trump has the government of Trump has و کاری که داره انجام میده کاری است که بر علیه ملت ایران و منافع ملی ایرانه. Iran did have a 90-day warning that this would happen. So senior Iranian officials have been busy meeting with counterparts around the world to try to preserve the country's trading relationships. In the days after Trump's original announcement, Iran's foreign minister was in Brussels, asking other signatories of the deal, France, Germany, and the UK, not to bend to Trump's pressure campaign. Sanam Vakil, an Iran expert at Chatham House, says Iran has been trying to drive Europe away from the U.S. What they're doing differently is trying to uh, have a bit of a carrot and stick approach and continue to uh, divide the P5 plus one, the group of signatories that signed the nuclear deal, and actually try to foment a transatlantic break between uh, the EU and the U.S. European countries might be receptive to keeping up trade because Iran would extend the moratorium on its nuclear program in return, effectively keeping a kind of shadow deal in place. But European companies don't want to take the risk. Swedish truck maker Scania is stopping sales to Iran to avoid U.S. sanctions. French aircraft manufacturer ATR is in the middle of a deal to sell 20 airplanes to Iran Air. Five arrived over the weekend, but the rest of the order may not be delivered. So Iran is pursuing a second strategy, too, turning to non-European allies who aren't as scared of American sanctions and who want what Iran has to sell. And they have very strong ties with Russia, China, India, and also Turkey. And those four countries together are going to be very important to help Iran buffer against sanctions, to maintain the flow of oil sales in order to keep revenue coming into, uh, into its markets. Iran's oil sales had reached 2.7 million barrels a day this year, the highest level since the nuclear deal was signed in 2015. China and India are Iran's biggest customers. China has rejected America's request to cut imports, and India has carved out its own way to keep up trade. Hamara bahut saaf kehna hai ki hum UN sanctions ko mante hain, country specific sanctions ko nahi mante. But even as Iran tries to find new partners, the threat of sanctions has already taken its toll. The value of Iran's currency hit a record low on Sunday. It was a week before my 23rd birthday. So that night when I went back to my boyfriend's house, um, I got high in the bathroom and fell asleep on the couch. And when I woke up the next morning, I was just like, I couldn't walk. My, I went to stand up and I just like fell to the ground. And um, 
just I was like uh, freaking out, like screaming, crying, basically, because I didn't know what was wrong with me. And it was just because of like, I, I pinched a nerve. Somewhere during that, um, my boyfriend realized that it was like, I kept on um, discovering my leg was paralyzed like every 10 minutes. It was like every 10 minutes, it was like this discovery. So he knew that my, my brain was fucked up. It was just very odd. Like he would be himself, he was fine, he was himself, but then he'd forget. A bunch of times he would just look at me and say, why am I here? You know, what are we doing here? At first in the hospital, he was, you know, full on dementia or something. It was just every few minutes, we would have to just write stuff on the whiteboard so that he would stop asking the same questions. We had gotten a call about a patient uh, transferred from an outside hospital. He wasn't laying down or forming new memories, and it was uh, pretty debilitating for him. We wound up getting uh, an MRI on him uh, overnight um, to investigate the, the memory loss. Uh, Max had a bright signal in his short-term memory center, and it's called the hippocampus, and it was completely engulfed in the signal from, from head to tail. By the end of 2015, we were up to, to 14 of these cases. In 2017, we captured four additional cases and all four tested positive for fentanyl. I feel like the whole, like the past five years have blurred into like one year kind of for me. But I know that my overdoses have all been fentanyl. Fentanyl was a, a culprit that was in our minds actually from the, from the beginning. Um, Max's case um, arose at the same year of the, as the fentanyl epidemic here in, in Massachusetts in 2012. And so I wound up getting in touch with Dr. Kofke at the University of Pennsylvania. He had done a whole series of studies where he had injected rats with fentanyl and had demonstrated that Fentanyl actually caused the hippocampus in the rat to be hyperactive. It was developing seizures. Spikes, spikes, spike, 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 spike. You know, the depolarization, the, the firing of groups of, uh, of brain cells would, would they fire and then stop and then fire again and then stop, you know, over and over again. I've seen a, an abundant amount of evidence that it does predispose to seizure activity in the memory areas of the brain. Seizures cause brain damage has been well worked out. So fentanyl given all by itself, or drugs like it, I think they're absolutely safe during surgery. Okay, but for these people who are taking illicit drugs, they're a setup for this phenomenon occurring if they survive the, the high dose. What's the difference? The French has a layer of whipped cream in there, and it has a Grand Marnier. I started working at La Patisserie again, because I was able to remember old stuff, but nothing new. It is a little bit hard for me. Like if I have to make someone a sandwich or something, I'll probably ask them the same question All like right. three times in a row. Did I forget anything? Both of my cupcakes and then okay. another eclair. Yeah. All right, yeah. That'll work. And then the box will be filled. Okay. <laughs> Did I confuse you? No. But I can remember like, you know, my phone number from when I was a kid or like something like that. But still, like I have a hard time remembering appointments, dates, times my schedule for work, anything. Max has the longest follow-up of any of the patients, and he had deficits, you know, well over, you know, a year out. We know the scope of the problem is larger than just, just Massachusetts, and somebody who's not laying down new memories, who's not able to learn new material, isn't going to be able to remember the steps that they need to take in order to necessarily effectively engage in their treatment. It changed everything. It changed everything. I can't plan for things. Small things become huge to me and my anxiety takes over and I just like can't handle it and run away. Hi, my name is Lindsay Jordan, and my project is called Snail Mail. Pristine is about allowing yourself to be hopelessly in love and still being able to make fun of it. I knew I wanted to make 
uh, guitar-driven record, and Christine was the first song that I wrote for it. There's like a different lead guitar line on every verse. You wouldn't maybe notice on like the first listen, but it carries the melody of the song. A song that was really inspirational in the studio was Incinerate by Sonic Youth. I just really like the punchy, straightforward sounding guitar tone. For the bass parts, I wanted to make sure that they had some, uh, uh, it serves more of a purpose than doubling the guitar. But isn't over the top and distracting, because I, I always want the guitar to be the main focus. It was like a genuine complaint about my life at the time, which was I would like go to a party, leave, and then go to Dunkin' Donuts, and then like stay there all night. <laughs> but it's also kind of like a profound statement about like the monotony of life. <laughs> I think that the most honest music comes from just wanting to write songs as an outlet, rather than thinking about where those songs will go or how people will perceive them. Still